Hi everyone. So for this week we're going to be talking about the post-colonial. That's going to be our, our central theme for the class. And what I've done is I've sort of taken, uh, taken this in three stages. Uh, so the first part of the lecture we're going to be talking a little, a little bit about the history of colonial displays. Um, then towards the, the center we're going, to, we're going to move all the way up to the 1980s which is really in some ways like the beginning and the heyday of post-colonial theory um, um, in the 80s and, and, and the 1990s. So we're going to talk about a couple key exhibitions from that period. And then after that, we're going to talk about individual artistic practices, uh, and we're going to bring it up more towards the, pre the present. And along the way, what I'm going to do, I teach a whole class just on post-colonial um, post art and theory and the history of exhibitions. So there's a lot there's a, there's a lot there. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, interspersed throughout this lecture, I give you key terms and key ideas that have to do with uh, post post colonialism. Um, and I would I suppose the first thing to do is to define post colonial, right? Um, so for the past four hundred years or so, since at, at the very uh, at the very uh, latest Christopher Columbus um, and the discovery of the so called New World. Um, you, we had we, we had a period of Western colonization, uh, Western imperialism, and, and Western uh, colonialism, um, where other peoples in in the world, in Africa, in Latin America, uh, and of course in this country, uh, were, were were colonized by Western uh, imperial powers, right? And so that's a whole long history, one that's definitely a history that we we need to know, we need we need to study. Then in the mid 20th century, um, starting in the 50s and 60s, definitely with Algeria and other places, you had uh, what's known as the, the process of decolonization. You had uh, struggles for former colon for, for colonies to become former colonies. Um, in some in some cases through violent re revolution, um, in order to get rid of their occupiers, in order to get rid of Western Western colonizers. Um, and then once this process of decolonization happened and you have sovereign states um, like Algeria, like, like South Africa, like Senegal, like uh, you know, basically every, every country in, in Africa and in Latin America, um, you enter into a period of what some scholars call the post-colonial period, so the period after colonialism. And from the start, I'm going to complicate this a little bit, and it's going to be helpful for our discussion to keep in mind that that a lot of people, especially today, um, consider the post-colonial to be a little outdated and maybe a little premature in the sense that uh, the process of, of decolonization, of the, and the, the decolonial, um, and we're going to be talking about this quite a bit, vis-a-vis uh, -vis museums, uh, decolonizing museums, decolonize this place and that sort of thing, that actually this is an ongoing, uh, this is an ongoing process, right? Um, so these terms, colonization, colonial, post-colonial, decolonial, are, are all these terms you really want to have in mind as we're looking at, at this history. So like I said, I'm going to start a little bit with the history of colonialist displays because they tell us so much about how other people uh, Non-Western peoples' cultures were were, were thought of um, and instrumentalized um, and, and and exploited uh, during this history, and so you have you have these colonialist displays, which usually were included in these universal exhibitions, which were very very popular in the nineteenth uh, and even up into the mid twentieth century. Um, you may have studied these these displays elsewhere, but these were basically big uh, exhibitions. Um, where all the different nations, all the different so-called de you know, de developed nations, um, you know, Western Europe um, and the United States, they would come and they, they would show their latest art, their latest technology, and so on and so forth. But if they were also, uh, um, if, if they also had colonies, uh, they would also show the, you know, the, 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 their colonies. They would even build exhibitions to look like... Um, the colonial their, their colonial landscapes that they were that they were um, that they were in control over, um, and they would even bring in human beings from their their colonies, um, and they would basically force them to live in the, the exhibition and to, to sort of perform 
you know, they're supposedly authentic selves and so on and so forth. Um, and so this is why scholars today call these human zoos. Um, and it's not really an exaggeration in the sense that they were uh, displayed, these human beings were displayed and confined um, in, in more or less artificial, artificial settings as like spectacle for, for the Western uh, public. So these would happen in lots of different countries in France and, and in England. There were, some, there were some in the United States for sure. And so there's this whole legacy of these, these uh, human zoos and colonial displays, this whole archive of photographs, of ephemera, of texts. Um, and if you're interested, this is a, a book that came out very recently, really documenting this history thoroughly. It's quite an incredible and, and harrowing, um, harrowing book. Um, it's almost unimaginable that, that, that these displays were, um, um, were part of the cultural imagination. Um, and in fact, they were incredibly popular and, and well-liked, right? And so here's just an example uh, from the Universal Exhibition in Liège in, in Belgium from 1905. Uh, this would have been the Senegalese um, uh, village where they even built a pool. Um, and so you can tell it's a really uncomfortable photograph to look at. Um, and there are a lot of uncomfortable photographs and works that we talk about and look at today uh, where you have the, the public... Uh, you know, this very, they, they seem to be um, more or less well-to-do uh, bourgeois, petit bourgeois, um, 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 uh, like a class people, uh, you know, the Europeans, and they're there watching um, these Senegalese who were imported um, and then, you know, basically are, are, are living in this, um, in this display, right? Um, and there was, in, in this literature that you, you you, you get the sense that there was a, a really cognitively dissonant set of desires and emotions on, on the behalf of the colonizer, on the behalf of, of the Western viewer here, um, that the, that the um, um, in this case, the, the, the Senegalese, um, in this case, the, the, the black body, is, is sort of projected with all sorts of different um, desires and emotions, like amazement, anxiety, fear, disgust, but also eroticism, um, you know, there's, a, there's sort of like a, a disturbing power, um, power relation, relationship here, um, and also a sense of su superiority. Um, so here I am the, the watcher and you are the watched, I am the colonizer, you are the colonized, right? Um, it was almost like a, a safe place to see the colony um, for, the, for the Western public. So this is giving you a sense of the history of these, these type of displays. Um, that, that would be um, uh, colonialist uh, uh, minded, um, there would be colonialist displays. There are artists like Carrie Mae Weems much later who will, who will um, start interrogating this and, 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 and critiquing it, uh, this idea of, of uh, the non-Western body, the, the idea of the, the, the non-white other um, or the racialized other. Um, and a lot of this history is wrapped up in what are now pseudoscientific anthropological theories of race, um, uh, which have been which have been um, uh, thoroughly discredited, and Carrie Mae Weems presents us with this with this work. She worked with an archive of um, of anthropological photography, and these are very uncomfortable to, to, to look at. They they make you um, uh, at least they make me quite uneasy. These are human beings that were treated as um, you know laboratory specimen in some ways to be. Text, to, 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 be, to, to enter into a type of racial taxonomy, to be prodded, um, to be, you know, um, scientifically controlled. Um, and so she's using these images and she's altered the color of them to be this sort of deep, dramatic blood red. And then she has um, a text that flows from one to the next. Um, and I've seen these at MoMA. They've been all, they've been all displayed all together at MoMA. And it reads almost like this story of... of um, of, of domination and expo exploitation at the level at the, at the hands of, of Western anthropology and, and photography too. It's an indictment of, of the way in which photography was used, um, and so this is related to these these displays, right? Because they're they're a way of making visible uh, the colonies and and, um, and human beings who are deemed to be other 
in various ways. Um, but that also means that this is you're seeing the way in which race um, um, and discrimination was constructed by by Western science and by Western modes of display um, um, and Western discourses, right? So this is very much part of this colonial history and then this post-colonial or decolonial critique of, of, of this history. So Carrie Mae Weems is a key as a key artist in, in this, in this, um, in this, um, in what we're considering today. And so uh, these, these, these exhibitions proliferated. They were really, really popular. Um, here are just a few, a few more posters to show you. Um, some of the biggest ones were Hamburg, Amsterdam, Paris, Chicago, Barcelona, Brussels, Osaka. There was one in, in Japan, um, and, and, and Wembley. Um, and again, I think I said this a moment ago, but the last one was in 1958, which just seems um, so recent, um, um, comparatively speaking. Um, and so, what did they all have in common? This is gonna this is gonna bring us to a key theme for 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 today's class, because as so often happens when it comes to the the, the history of colonization, when it comes to sort of nefarious nefarious conceptions of race and discrimination. Um, and, 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 and racism, um, not to mention all other forms of discrimination, they usually are, are like, uh, uh, the best way to describe it is cognitively dissonant. Uh, like they hold two mutually exclusive motives at once. Like there's something unstable and incoherent um, and illogical about, about um, so, so many forms of, of discrimination. And so on, on the one hand, um, these colonial displays, they, they aided in sort of constructing a national identity um, for these uh, Anglo-European countries. Uh, you know, the 19th century into the early 20th century is where uh, the modern nation states that we know today um, become consolidated. Like Germany isn't a, a unified nation, modern nation state until 1870, right? Uh, same goes for a number of different um, um, different nation states. Of course, not nation states like France or, or the United States. They were long established and unified. But nonetheless, this is definitely the moment where the the idea of of the nation state becomes consolidated. Um, and these these displays and the, the whole history of colonization um, establishes a certain type of superiority, a supposed superiority of these Western nation states. They sort of glorify their imperial ambitions. Um, and this is the most important part that I want you to, to learn, is that during this history of colonization and exploration and, 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 and imperialism, uh, the West thought of itself as providing a civilizing mission. So the idea is that the West thought they were civilizing the rest of the world, right? So the, the understanding is that the rest of the world is uncivilized, uncivilized or quote unquote, or primitive, quote unquote, or savage, quote unquote. Um, um, all these sort of pejorative words for um, the non-Western, uh, non-Western cultures. And so it thought itself as sort of the like the great savior of of these uncultured, uncivilized, quote unquote, um, um, communities and, and places around the, around the world. So that's on the one hand, right? But then on the other hand, and this is where things get really interesting, is that this, the iconography um, and the visuals and the, ex the, the exposure to other places of the world um, actually offered an escape from the very modern nation state, from the very idea of modernity, uh, which above all else privileged reason, industri in, in, in industry, and materialism, um, and, and wealth, and so on and so forth, right? Um, all these things that uh, supposedly other people in the world didn't have. They were all irrational, they were all, uh, they didn't have technology, and, um, and they're, they're superstitious, and wh whatever, all these sort of um, cliches that Westerners had about other people. The, the big irony here is, and this is where it gets completely cognitive, cognitively dissonant and, and, and strange, is that these displays, and not only the, these displays, um, um, all, there, there are all sorts of other things like, like photography, like film, um, and you can see it in this poster of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. This was like a, like a, almost like a Barnum and Bailey sort of operation where, where uh, like a kind of a circus that would go around and then you'd have 
it too sort of um, took um, um, indigenous people from this country, Native Americans, and forced them to sort of play and play fight and, you know, be a spectacle. The crazy part of this whole thing is that this this uh, afforded the, the the Westerner an escape and a, and a relief from uh, um, his or her own demanding culture, which is uh, the culture of modernity. Um, so so it's it's a it's it's almost like a crazy, um, almost hypocritical, and certainly cognitively dissonant um, setup here. Um, so this is roughly speaking, just a nice history of of these colonialist displays, and they're already allowing us to tap into sort of the Western colonial uh, psyche, which is exactly what um, some exhibitions coming up, and definitely a number of artists that we're going to talk about, um, uh, go a long way into critiquing and subverting and laying bare. So we're moving uh, very quickly now uh, forward into, into history, uh, there's a lot that happens in the 20th century when it comes to reconsidering non-Western visual cultures and tribal objects and the way the way the ways in which they influenced, especially European uh, mo modernist um, artists, especially someone like Picasso and the Surrealists and Dubuffet in the 1950s and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of history we're leaving we're leaving behind, but uh, we we now pick it up in the in the 1980s because there are two exhibitions that are really profoundly influential for uh, the emergence of post-colonial discourse and theory in art and culture um, and a reconsideration of non-Western cultures and objects and, and creativity and art making. And so one of these was in 1984 at MoMA by the curator William Rubin. It was the Primitivism Show. And Primitivism is in quotes there, you can tell. So uh, he's problematizing or calling attention to the, to the very idea of primitivism. And in many ways, everything I've been describing to you, this, uh, this really um, um, a sad history and unfortunate colonial history that, that I've been describing in the, the, these, these colonialist displays, they were all in the service of what was known as primitivism. Um, and primitivism was the idea very much connected to um, um, uh, outdated theories of race and non-Western cultures that certain types of people are more primitive than others or backwards or further back in time or what have you. Um, so Rubin's show sort of starts to pick away at this um, in the sense that for the first time ever, rather than, than showing, you know, the, 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 the most canonical Western artists like Picasso or Matisse or Dubuffet, the way in which they were influenced by uh, tribal objects, by non-Western visual cultures, rather than just um, leaving that as a footnote, the primitivism show showed tribal objects and non-Western creativity um, and object making in the very same galleries as the as the work as these very famous Western works themselves. Um, so here's a famous installation shot of the the very well known centerpiece painting for the, for the Western collection of modern art at MoMA, Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. And in that room are uh, tribal masks um, that are uh, <clears throat> um, displayed alongside. And it's very, very well known if you've taken early 20th century art uh, with me or someone else, you'll know that uh, um, African masks played a major role for Picasso in, in this painting and in this phase of his career. So this is a big step forward, but a lot of a lot of critics uh, said that y yes, it's great that you're showing these tribal objects alongside these these Western modernist works, uh, but you're really only doing it for formal reasons, um, and you're talking about the way in which they have like visual affinities, uh, but you're not really getting deeper into the into the history or the culture, um, and certainly not into the the colonial history. Of, of these objects. After all, all these objects are, 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 are basically um, uh, plundered or a part of a colonial Western history of object, uh, of, of object gathering and, and, and the, 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 the domination, and in some cases, the, 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 the violation of, of other cultures, right? So it, it, it stayed at a somewhat formal, uh, formal level, but it's still a step forward. It's still a seminal, um, uh, seminal show for, for this idea. 
even more forward-looking, um, though not without its own problems, is a show that happens um, a few years later. And it's curated by Jean-Hubert Martin, and it's at the, Pom the Pompidou in Paris. It was called Magicien de la Terre, um, which can be translated to the Magicians of the Earth. But it's also known as the Whole Earth Show, um, because it was the first exhibition that displayed a uh, large-scale exhibition that displayed global uh, contemporary art practices. Uh, you had a hundred different artists, half of them uh, were, were Western, and the other half came from all different parts of, of, of the world. So rather than, and, and many of them were, um, I'm going to show you in a moment, many of them were actually commissioned to come and make work. So these were living contemporary artists in non-Western uh, modes of, of object making. Right? So this is a very much a step forward from Rubens' primitivism show because it's not simply like these objects that look like and influenced you know, you know Picasso and Matisse or whatever. They're here um, at their own merit, on their own merit, um, and they're presented more or less you know equally alongside um, Western, you know, European and, and U.S. artists at the time with this equal mix. So this is an important step, an important exhibition in the history of representing um, including, and including uh, non-Western cultural production in contemporary art. Uh, there were uh, some criticisms uh, in the sense that uh, to call art magic, to call them magicians, there was a way in which like this sort of uh, mystification of non-Western cultural production um, is somehow like you know non-modern or more spiritual or more authentic or something like that. It's as if maybe there there are still there are certain primitivist cliches that still clung to this exhibition, uh, and that was certainly part of of the, the the discourse and the reviews at the time. Uh, but still, it's a major major uh, show forward, um, and it really in some ways it starts the history of post-colonial exhibitions. So when I teach the post-colonial exhibition course. We really start with this course, and then we move forward, and we see how shows in the 90s and the 2000s, and then even more recently, go much further than this show. But it's an important point of origin for post-colonial uh, thinking in uh, contemporary art. And so I just thought I'd show you a, an example, uh, probably the most famous installation shot of uh, Les Magiciens de la Terre, is the one where the, the curator um, uh, coupled Richard Long's Red Earth Circle, He's kind of a, a post-minimalist earth, uh, earth work artist uh, who, who uh, very well known, who does this massive uh, installation work, um, this large red uh, earth circle. And it was coupled precisely, and in some ways like the primitive in the show, because there are certain formal affinities, I suppose, with um, um, an Aboriginal community that comes from Australia. And they work on their traditional... Uh, forms of sand painting uh, called yam dreaming um, and they're a fascinating community if you study Australian Aboriginal art um, like a lot of it is uh, knowledge or forms of knowing the land that's barred to the outsider right so in some ways them even coming here um, and making this work is, is, um, is quite quite ground uh, quite groundbreaking so by the time we get um, into the 1990s, you have a, a new type of paradigm that seems to emerge when it comes to art practices, which really in many ways comes out of the history that we've been tracing, both the long, the long, deep colonial history, but then the more recent history of, of exhibitions in the 1980s that started to, to bring in questions and issues that have to do with multiculturalism, that have to do with, the, with issues of post-colonial or decolonizing de 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 politics um, and the ways in which um, um, the history of colonialism continues to, to, to affect our institutions, um, the ways in which society relates to itself, um, and in many ways the way in which um, uh, past history continues to haunt contemporary history. And so you had artists that started to, I think, let's say, move away from studio-based practices, uh, and even in some cases of making objects themselves, and they started to become what how Foster has argued was more like the artist as ethnographer. And by this he means um, the artist doing field research in the way that an anthrop anthropologist or ethnographer would do. Ethnographers and anthropologists study other cultures um, and human societies and communities. Um, 
And so you, you have artists that, that start to do this. It's as if like the artist is doing field work and is doing archival research. And in many cases, you'll see the examples I give, they're, they're, they're doing this type of work in order to like pick away at the surface of society, pick at the way at the surface of institutions to see what's underneath. Um, and oftentimes what's underneath is uh, very much worth inspecting um, and, and uh, reflective of maybe a historical wound or um, a historical trauma that needs to be reckoned with uh, and that needs to be part of the artistic and social and polit political dialogue. And so there are a number of, of really wonderful examples of this. So one's Lothar Baumgarten, a German artist. Uh, this is an installation at the Guggenheim in 1994. And many of you, I'm sure, have been to the Guggenheim, so you know wh how this installation shot is taken, with sort of a quasi-bird's-eye view from the top, the top part looking down on the rotunda. And on the bottom, he has spelled out borrowed land for, for sale. And then along the side of, um, of uh, the Guggenheim, all these... Um, former tribes um, that would have been in, in, in New York and the United States. So in some sense, bringing up the past of indigenous First Nations, um, which certainly are, do, don't have any representation um, in, in, in the Guggenheim, and I, I, I think it continues to not really have any representation at the Guggenheim and so many major museums, um, although in academia, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely be, beginning to change. Um, another example would be, um, sorry, this was out of, this was out of order. Um, another example would be Edgar, Edgar Heap of, of Birds. Um, he's part of, um, um, he's, he's a Cherokee, uh, and he, he's done these amazing works. They're called Native Hosts, and he started them in 1988, and they're ongoing. Um, and a lot like uh, Baumgarten, um, he, uh, uh, he alludes to the, 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 the ways in which, uh, in this case, New York, um, and this is Central Park, the way in which a place that seems so natural, so American, so, so New York, um, is in fact, from the perspective of First Nations, uh, an occupier, uh, uh, unoccupied land, right? Um, and so it's kind of, it's, it's actually quite, quite witty in many ways. So he, he turns everything backwards, like, so New York becomes strange, that, that goes backwards. And then it says, you know, New York today, your host is Shinnecook, one of the original 12 uh, tribes uh, of, of, of the New York, the, the New York area. Uh, and so it's witty, you know, to think like New York and the United States is being hosted by um, uh, uh, First Nations. But it's also quite abiding, right? Because this is nothing that uh, certainly no one in, in, no one in power um, really uh, thinks, thinks of this. And normal everyday people walking through Central Park probably also don't think of, of the, the, the potency and the history of, of, of New York City and indeed of the whole, the whole United States. Um, though again, you know, this, is, this is starting to change um, in, in many ways. Um, today's actually, it's, it's interesting that I'm recording this lecture today because it's pretty historic that Deb Haaland uh, is, a, is a, a Native American and she's right now testifying or being uh, presented to um, uh, the uh, to Congress in order to become the first um, um, Native American um, um, uh, part of the home uh, homeland of, of the interior, uh, so it's it's quite interesting. Uh, then you also have someone like David Hammonds. Uh, this is this really well known African American flag. Uh, where he's taken the, the American flag and then given it um, a, a different twist. Um, um, and then they called it African Amer Amer American flag. And also, in, in many ways, the, the legacy of, of slavery, um, the, the legacy of the, the Middle Passage, um, is, is connected to, uh, indelibly connected to the history of colonialism. So in this country, not only do we have legacies of colonialism that have to do with uh, First Nations, but we also have the legacy of, of colonialism in the sense that um, the slave trade came from uh, colonies um, in Africa, um, uh, from which they would be sent to Latin America and, and North America. Um, and so he's, he's, he's like woven into the fabric of like the most American symbol possible, the, the United States flag. He's 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 uh, he's altered it. Um, he's Africanized it in some ways. 
to the choice of color. Um, and it, it really resonates with something that a lot of people are arguing today uh, and, and, and claiming, and I think rightly so, that the United States didn't become a democracy um, until 1964 with the Voting Rights Act, um, where for the first time um, African Americans could, could vote, right? So there's some way in which this is like the most patriotic flag possible because it's, it's sort of alluding to this near past of civil rights where finally, um, after, after all these centuries, uh, the, the U.S. became a fully-fledged democracy. All its citizens could have the vote, right? So it's a very potent, potent work. There's a lot, a lot to say about it. Um, and David Hammond's wonderful at the level of, his, of, of making objects, but he also did uh, some, some, some great performances, and this is one of my, my favorites, uh, his Blizzard Ball Sale from 1983. This is near Astor Place. Um, and what he did is very simple, but it's devastatingly um, incisive about society, about race, about the economy. Um, uh, so so he, he, he came, he came uh, and basically started um, um, selling his wares. Uh, which were you know, on a snowy day. So he made all these snowballs of different sizes, put them on, on a rug, and then offered them up for sale. And they're all different prices. And, uh, you know, when I'm in, when, when we're in class, this is a type of work where you spend quite a, quite a long time discussing because it's so rich. There's so many things you, there's so many things you could say um, uh, about, about this work. Uh, and so I, I hope we'll end up talking about it when, when, when we meet. But I just love the idea of someone coming to the marketplace and, um, um, and, and, and selling something that's so... Uh, uh, I, I don't know, quite know how to describe it. It's so um, um, uh, useless in some ways. On a snowy day to sell, to sell uh, um, uh, snowballs as if that's the only thing that, that, that he has to offer. I don't think that's the only way to interpret this. I think there are a number of ways of interpreting it, but uh, it's, it's a very rich work. Um, probably the, the, the artist most associated with the artist as, a, as ethnographer is going out into a community or going into, institu into an institution and doing archival field work and sort of picking apart um, the biases and the presuppositions is Fred Wilson and his very uh, iconic work called Mining the Museum, which was from 1992. This was at the Maryland Historical Society, um, which is in, is in uh, Baltimore. Um, and they asked him to come in. So the Maryland Historical Society is a place that shows um, the material culture of the United States. And so uh, it's you know, what you might imagine, like a, a National History Museum or something like this, would show... Uh, furniture would show armor would show um, uh, you know all the material the, the, the material artifacts and archive of, of, of the nation and so they asked him to come in and to go into their archive into the basement and pick objects that they've never really shown um, and sort of reorganize and recurate the the exhibition and so what he decided to do um, is mine the museum, right? This is where mining comes from. He went and mined the museum and brought out certain things and then displayed them with the, reg the regular displays. So here's one example, the metalwork display where you have like, you know, these, these, these incredibly ornate um, and lavish silverware, probably from the colonial period. Um, yes, not probably, definitely from... Uh, um, um, the, sorry, the, the uh, pre mainly pre-Civil War period. In the United States um, and you can see what he's added um, he's changed the, the display and he's added uh, shackles slave shackles right uh, which technically is also if this is metal work that's a type of metal work right but it's the last thing that most people would normally see next to this beautiful sil beautiful silver silverware right because this points to a really traumatic difficult wound within the, the with it within um, the, the history of slavery in this country as does this, um, silver itself probably coming from slave labor, uh, but it's not something most people would normally think about if they're just on their own, right? They would think, oh, wow, these are beautiful, these are old, so on and so forth, right? So uh, he's doing this kind of work, uh, this archival work, which is sort of forcing this unconscious material to come up um, and, and adamantly be part of 
the, 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 the popular conscious, like the, the viewer's consciousness. Um, and he did this in a number of different ways. Um, so at some, in, in one room, he, he took a clan, um, a clan um, um, robe and put it in with, uh, with, with the display of baby carriages. Um, and another one is uh, in the cabinet making section uh, where you have all these, you know, these beautiful old chairs. He put a whipping post in there, which is also so in some ways like um, um, they would often fit with with the rest of the display because this is this is cabinet making. And in some perverse way, this is also cabinet making. Uh, but it's not it's the last thing you would normally think of um, when when you see, you know, nice Chippendale chairs in, in, a, in a historical society. So Fred Wilson um, was 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 forcing a reconsideration of, of American history, which uh, today is very much part of, of, of the popular discourse um, um, and very much um, um, part of even the, the educational system. In the eighties and nineties, I don't think it was yet there. I don't think uh, it was it was a um, um, part of the conversation in the way the way it is today, especially with Black Lives Matter and uh, so many of the things that have happened in the past uh, decade, and even just five years. Um, so this this installation, this very very canonical installation by Fred Wilson, taps into this colonial history and also this history of, of slavery in a very potent uh, potent way. Uh, Rene Green is another artist that's associated with with, with this art, artist as ethnographer. Um, and this is a really interesting work. So she would travel around a lot and do site-specific, community-specific works. Um, and this is an installation that she did. It's called Scene from, from 1990. And in some ways, at first, it's hard to sort of um, uh, understand what's, what's going on. But essentially, it's a, a, a platform um, that is both... I've, I've, read it, I've read it interpreted as both a stage, you know, like a stage where you would perform... Uh, but also, and this is dark, an auction, an auction block, right? So think of like being put up for auction in the way that, that human beings were um, during, during, during slavery. And so you as the viewer, you as the gallery goer are sort of implicated. Like you, you, you become, you can't really like uh, hang back and, and remain objective. Like you become part of, of the work. Um, you, you, you take center stage, like quite literally. Um, and there's a light that, that sort of um, hits you. And your shadow will then uh, be projected on a screen. Um, and at the bottom of this, you'll see an eye that's looking back at you. So like there's this voyeuristic sort of vibe here of you being looked at, right? Um, and the whole, the whole thing is in fact about two people in history. Um, one is um, uh, the so-called Venus of Hottentot, uh, Venus of Hottentot uh, Sarah Bartman. Uh, who was w well known? She was a, a South African in the 19th century who was um, basically forced to. Uh, this goes back to the beginning of today's class, the human zoos and this sort of thing. Uh, forced to uh, be displayed. Um, she went. Was, she was brought to England, and and and, and people inspected her, and um, she was part of scientific and, and public discourse and so on and so forth. But she was an object to be looked at and prodded. Um, um, so it was, it's a, it's a pretty terrible history and the, the writing on the, the writing on the, you see this, 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 this person who's at the, who's at the gallery, she's actually reading, right? Um, looking at the eye, looking back at her, but also reading. Um, and it's actually the autopsy report of, of, um, the Venus of Hottentot. Uh, uh, it's, so it's, it's, a. Uh, um, very, 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 very charged, very, very, very loaded in a way that you, you maybe just from the outside, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't think. And the other figure that, that this work is about, um, and this is maybe where the stage comes in, the theater stage, is Josephine Baker, um, who was a very, very popular uh, singer-dancer in early 20th century, especially in Paris, and is also part of this primitivizing history of the quote-unquote exotic and the black body performing for a Western white audience. Um, and in this case, it was much more like chic, but still a type of uh, a type of 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 of, of tokenism and primitive and primitivizing 
um, and objectification, right? And there's a nice uh, um, during the installation, this song would play. So it's definitely one of those uh, one of those installations where it's hard to describe because uh, when you're there, you're kind of blinded by the light. You're reading this text. You're on a stage and you're hearing music. So it's almost as if you're put on you're put on the spot, right? Um, as if now you're the one who should be dancing and singing. So it's this really incredible, potent uh, reversal reversal of roles of viewer viewed, colonized, colonizer, um, discriminated, discriminated, exotic, local, you know, all these things. So uh, it's a it's a it's a very rich work. Um, then we come to uh, the last, the last few, few examples that, that I have for you. Um, a lot of the terms, a lot of the ideas we've been dealing with can be, can, can be used to, to analyze a lot of the works that in the chapter that I haven't shown you or a number of works that, that, um, that, that could be brought up that, 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 that fit with, with these terms. They can be used in lots of different ways. And one, one term I think that's really important, and in some ways, this is like in academia, this is the very origins of post-colonial uh, theory, and that's Edward Said's Orientalism from 1978. Uh, is a pivotal, pivotal book that really in many ways kicks, kicks off um, these post-colonial ideas and very influential on thinkers and on artists and on curators. And Orientalism, in the simplest way, um, is is the idea that the West, in literature, um, in film, in art, in 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 in, um, um, in anthropology, and even physically, like when when um, during during exploration, that the idea of the Orient, Orientalism, the Orient being not the Occident, being the non-Western. Um, and Edward, Edward Said's book, he's, he's talking about the Middle East and North Africa and Asia, um, though many, a lot of people today use Orientalism to, to be even more broad than that. But the idea of Orientalism, Edward Said is the first to come around and say, well, look, um, all these things that we can read about uh, uh, non-Western people that were, that were written or said or shown by Western artists or philosophers or, 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 or uh, writers, these are not... For the most part, this is not the truth of, of these other people. Uh, for the most part, this is a construction and like a Western fantasy and a projection about this other people. So it's as if uh, Said is saying that the way in which the West understood its other uh, was always warped by its own biases and prejudices um, and, and misunderstandings, right? Um, something that anthropology and philosophy and all sorts of disciplines since have, have been trying to um, write, right? So rather than go into another community, one you don't know, and sort of impose your own understanding of them, letting them speak, letting them uh, attest to, to who they are and what they do and what they mean and what's important to them, right? So Orientalism, like primitivism, is very often a, a, a Western projection onto another um, that usually says more about uh, uh, the, the, Western, uh, the, the, the Western mind than it does about the truth of the non-Western uh, people that's being seen or represented, right? There's this incredible quote by James Baldwin. If you don't know James Baldwin, he's a, one, of the, one, of the, one of the greatest um, uh, writers of the 20th century, part of the civil rights movement. And he, he it, it, just look up clicks, uh, clips of, of James Baldwin, um, and there was even uh, a, a film uh, that just came out, I think you can watch it on, on Netflix, a documentary about James Baldwin, just, just look it up. Um, and he basically says, like, uh, I know more about you than you know about me. And this is really incredible, right? Um, he's, he's a black gay man, um, and he's saying, he's saying to a, a white Western audience, I know more about you. Than you know about than you and my, you know about me, and you should listen to me, right? Uh, so this is a, in a, in a similar vein, right? Um, what an incredible moment where you have thinkers who start to realize 
that this Western fantasy, this construction of the rest of the world, is in many cases just a, 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 pure, a pure construction, which doesn't mean it doesn't have very real effects on everyday life. Uh, uh, because, of course, these, these fantasies and projections have power behind them. But to be able to sort of decode them and, and understand that they're not natural, that they've, had, they're, they've actually been constructed, is a, is a powerful tool, right? So Edward Said is really important for this. And a number of post-colonial thinkers um, uh, work, work in this mold. And so this gets us to an important uh, uh, an important theme in many of the, the works that, that were discussed in the reading for today, and that's the stereotypical grotesque. Because if there's one thing that Oriental, the Orientalist mind did is it stereotyped other people, right? A stereotype very often is like a cliche, um, a projection, or an understanding of someone that's not truthful, um, or only partly truthful, or, or uh, skewed, or, or um, warped, right? And so you had a lot of artists, and this might seem counterintuitive at first, but there are a lot of artists who then trafficked in the stereotypical grotesque. Um, so rather than uh, sort of critique the, the, their stereotypes in this very sort of detached way, um, instead they would embrace the stereotype, but to such a degree that they end up mocking the stereotype, right? So this is what, uh, this is um, how Foster is writing in our, in our essay, in, in our reading for today. He says, the stereotypical grotesque opens up a space where artists play with ethnic cliches, sometimes with light acerbic wit, sometimes with exaggerated explosive absurdity. So uh, it was a way of making fun, and, and by that, hopefully sort of breaking apart the, the, the cliches um, and the stereotypes that are in culture. And so we'll end with a number of these examples. Um, one artist who definitely fits this um, stereotypical grotesque is Jimmy Durham. Um, especially, I would say, his, his self-portrait from 1988. Um, the, the work on the right is the one that's, that's uh, reproduced in the textbook, uh, and I always have a, uh, a difficult time interpreting it in some ways. It's such a difficult object to, stri to try to understand. I think one way in which the stereotypical grotesque fits in, in, in this work is the, the, the animal skin, the pelt, right, which is associated with um, um, Native Americanness and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you have this strange banana-shaped phone, and it's on a wooden plank that's been paint, painted blue. And on the scroll's back is a quote from Frantz Fanon, um, who's a, a key um, post-colonial, decolonial thinker. Um, in the mid 20th century, um, one of those really foundational towering figures um, who wrote um, white, uh, uh, Black Skin, White Mask, and The Wretched of the Earth. Um, so it's a very loaded, uh, very loaded object in many, in many ways. I think the self-portrait is the one that's more, uh, I think, more obviously part of the stereotypical grotesque or easier to talk about because it's a self-portrait and he seems to be taking on all of the, the cliches, all the stereotypes, all sort of like the, the cigar store Indian kind of um, uh, aesthetic um, in this self-portrait. So he's taking on the, this, uh, uh, these stereotypes in order to, to render them absurd or in, in order to, to, to manifest them in certain ways. So I think you can tell this in the face. And uh, there's all this writing on his body. Um, at one point here it says... Mr. Durham has stated that he believes he has an addiction to alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, and does not feel well, um, and does not sleep well. And so you have, you know, these, these, uh, th these cliches, these stereotypes of alcoholism, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's, a, uh, I'm basically lighthearted, and you have chicken feathers for a heart. Uh, so, so he's playing with these representations, these stereotypes of, of, of being... Um, of being Native, Native American in a way of like throwing them back in the face of those who might who might hold these stereotypes. Um, so he definitely fits this bill. Uh, and another project, and we're going to end here. Um, and uh, I'll just I'll just let this play, and then there'll be this will be the end of, of the lecture. But is Coco Fusco and the work she did with Guillermo uh, Gomez Pena called "Couple in a Cage: Two Undiscovered American Indians Visit the West." From 1992 to 1993, 
Um, and this is basically, there's a, it's on Vimeo actually, if you want to see the whole thing, whole documentation of this performance, it's on Vimeo. Uh, so this is simply the, the trailer, but essentially what they did is they, um, they, they pulled like kind of like a, a mockumentary stunt in some ways. They convinced people uh, and they played the role of, of these people that they were that there were two um, people uh, natives that, that were that had gone undiscovered um, and now they're being displayed in museums. So this is a nice callback to the very beginning of this lecture of human zoos and colonial displays because here you have an artist identifying with those. Uh, and, and like even recreating it and putting her uh, as, 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 as an object to, 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 be, um, to be gawked at in the museum, but in such a way that renders the whole thing absurd, uh, ridiculous, uh, and sort of makes a mockery uh, of, of this history and implicates the viewer, uh, implicates the, 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 the museum go at the same time. Um, so I'll show you this and then uh, that'll be the end of, of, of this lecture because I think it's gone... Uh, pretty long. There was a lot this week, and uh, well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you next week or in class. <laughs>